Hey everybody, how's it going? Uh, my name is Rich. I am a senior director of engineering at an Irish tech startup called Intercom. My colleague Brian introduced Intercom earlier on this morning. He said uh, Intercom is that uh, live chat software bubble that hopefully some of you have used before and found not too awful. Um, quick show of hands, who here is from Galway? Cool, loads of people. Uh, who here has ever gone swimming off Black Rock Diving Tower in Salt Hill? Uh, wow, awesome. A uh, couple of really good, uh, brave souls here. So normally I introduce myself, oh, I'm from Intercom, I do engineering, yada, yada, yada. Uh, given the day that's in it, uh, I, thought I'd, uh, I thought I would also introduce myself as a wannabe Galwegian. Uh, I'm actually originally from Dublin, but for the last 20 years or so, I've been coming down to Galway as often as I possibly can, and swimming in the sea here is absolutely my favorite thing to do. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about that too much, uh, too much today, though. The thing I'm actually gonna talk about is one of Intercom's engineering strategies called uh, Run Less Software. And uh, when I was actually preparing for this talk, I was working with a really, really good speaking coach by, uh, by the name of Patrick Sutton from the, uh, from the Gaiety School of Acting. And I was after putting the bones of the talk together with all the technical strategy and everything like that. And uh, Patrick asked, he said, Rich, how do you want people to feel as you're giving this talk? Like, let's actually bring some emotion and kind of storytelling into it. Uh, how do you want people to feel? And I kind of thought about it for a little while. And I said, uh, well, when I think about this stuff, is that, uh, sorry, I thought my screen was flickering for a sec. Uh, when I actually think about this topic, uh, for me, it's kind of like, um, it's almost like a little bit of a dark, scary, uh, pessimistic uh, topic. But hopefully, if you actually work through it, you'll kind of have this little bit of a light bulb opened, awakening hope and glory at the end. And Patrick, my coach, was like saying, Rich, what are you talking about? Uh, are you like doing some sort of a horror movie or drama or are you giving some sort of a tech talk? Uh, and I said, okay, okay, bear with me. Um, and uh, I kind of had another, dis I had this other little light bulb moment and I said, I think I have a way I can explain it. Uh, and so I got up at a whiteboard and I started to draw out this kind of uh, map with kind of all these kind of uh, armies uh, and different kind of um, different kind of people on the battlefield, and I said, Patrick, the reason the reason actually why I think this is kind of a, a scary story is, I think the kind of competitive landscape we live in today uh, as technology professionals in this software for business, software for profit world is actually super competitive. I think there's so many different things going on, and if you don't understand everything that's going on, it's really hard to kind of survive and thrive in this world. And he said, I think you're paranoid, Rich. I think there's, I don't know what you're talking about. You're actually gonna to have to explain that to me a little bit more. And so the first army I pointed to was uh, us, Intercom. I said, so we are actually kind of this first uh, army on the battlefield. Where are we, the innovation startups? I said, we're, we're these people who, who consider ourselves pure of heart. We have this kind of business idea. We're trying to execute it to the absolute best of our abilities, bring the absolute best value to our customers, and really kind of do, uh, re really do some good in the world. But the second group of people on this battlefield are copycats. And uh, these are the people who, who see our good idea and think, I'd like to do that as well. I'm gonna copy it. And it has never been easier to be a copycat in the world today. Uh, why I think a lot of the basic barriers to entry into markets are evaporating. Uh, money is cheap at the moment, uh, believe it or not. Interest rates are at an all-time low. Investors are incentivized to put their money anywhere other than in a bank. So if you have a, if you have a half-decent business idea, or better yet, if your business idea is to copy my business idea, which which already has traction and social proof in the market, it's probably gonna be pretty easy for you to get some money. One of the other uh, traditional barriers to entry is also, is also evaporating. Execution is becoming easy. 
if we think about like all of the different uh, changes over in in the software world over the last kind of 10 years or so, if you think about uh, infrastructure as a service, software as a service, database as a service, soon to be serverless, functions as a servers, uh, service. If you think about all of the beautiful software development frameworks we have these days, like Ruby on Rails, Angular, Iconic, all these things, uh, all of these things now mean that one of your competitors with just an email address, an internet connection, little bit of money, credit card, and a very small group of junior developers, they're able to build a working copy of your thing in days or weeks, even though it actually might have taken you years in order to bring it all together. Basic marketing and selling is becoming easy as well. If we think about the uh, uh, Apple Store, the Apple App Store or Google Play Store, if you think about all of the super powerful advertising engines, Facebook and YouTube and all these people are giving, people, uh, you can now build something and and launch it and market it to uh, an audience of billions really, really, really easily. So maybe people can see a little bit where kind of some of my paranoia is starting to come from. Uh, the, third, uh, uh, the third army on the battlefield is us, the army of talent. And uh, the war for talent is really, is really, really fierce right now. Uh, if you think about it, I was looking up some stats online. I think tech jobs in the in the U.S. demand outstrips supply three to one. So for every three jobs, there's only one person there to uh, apply for them. I bet you there's been a bunch of people like explicitly trying to hire here today because we all know how difficult it is to get really good engineers. Uh, and the fourth, uh, uh, the fourth army on this battlefield is kind of really a, a quartet of armies. I call them the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, I didn't actually coin this phrase. There's a guy called Scott Galloway. If any of you follow him on Twitter, he's awesome. He, he wrote a book about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And the four horsemen are Amazon, Apple, Google, and Facebook. And I say that having worked for Amazon and Facebook in my former life. Um, and the four horsemen of the apocalypse, they're kind of interesting. They, they compete in the battle on a number of dimensions. So the first most obvious one is they compete in the war for talent. So Intercom is like a scrappy little startup in Dublin. Uh, we now have about 250 people in the office in Dublin. We, we aren't yet a public company, so we give out stock options rather than RSUs. The likes of Amazon, Google, Facebook, and Apple, all of these companies are public companies. They, they, give, they give out liquid stock uh, units, RSUs. So even kind, of in, even kind of competing in the war for talent, they're able to offer more money to people to come and work for them. They're working at a bigger scale. So they're kind of a pretty difficult group of people to uh, uh, compete against once you're trying to hire people. Uh, one of the other ways that I think they disrupt the war for talent, and it's almost like a war on talent, is they see all of this engineering scarcity, and they are slowly but surely, uh, re relentlessly introducing more and more and more service abstractions. So I said we started off with infrastructure as a service, then we went to like database as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, serverless. And as engineers, this is like, double-edged sword. On the one hand, if you're able to keep up with it, you're getting more and more cool tools, uh, cool tools to help you build things faster and faster and faster. On the other hand, if you aren't able to keep up with this rising tide of service abstraction, what happens is perhaps you could find your job being commoditized and deprecated. So I think that's kind of potentially a scary place to be in. Hopefully all of us here are like, Obviously, at a conference, driven learners, we're going to be the ones who are able to stay ahead of the service abstraction. Uh, and the last way that these four horsemen compete against you is the scariest way of all. Uh, God help you if they decide to enter your market and compete directly against you for your customers. 
Why? We've already talked about it. They have the bigger brand, bigger, bigger amount of engineers, bigger amount of resources, bigger amount of money. They're able to make longer term bets probably than you are. So if they come and decide to compete directly against you, it can be a pretty scary thing. Uh, not impossible to overcome, but uh, kind of scary. And so at this stage, as I kind of got finished describing all this stuff to my coach, Patrick, who's normally used to dealing with actors in the gaiety, he was like, Rich, you are the most paranoid person I've ever met. And he said, I, I, really, uh, I really think you need help, like chill out. Uh, and I said, Patrick, uh, I get why you might think like that, but let me, let me talk you through a couple of examples and then maybe you can give me another assessment. And so the first example I talked through was Slack versus HipChat. Who here uses Slack? Most people. Who here uses HipChat? Few still late adopters. I think uh, good, good for you. Um, so Slack versus HipChat is like an uh, interesting battle. So HipChat were one of the first people to come to market with uh, modern kind of uh, intra-team messaging. They did it re really, really well, but first to market doesn't matter anymore. It's first to do it best. Maybe it's always been first to do it best, but certainly now first mover advantage seems to be well and truly gone. Uh, so Slack came in, decided to do this game, and started to do it really, really, really well. And uh, this is actually where this story uh, ends. Slack just absolutely dominating. Well done, Slack. So that was like one example. I said, Patrick, I'll tell you another example. Uh, maybe this one might resonate a little bit more. Uh, Instagram and Snapchat. Who here uses Instagram? A few people. Who here uses Snapchat? Yeah, more people than I thought. Uh, so Inst Instagram and Snapchat's an, in an interesting one for me as well. Uh, so uh, Instagram uh, or Snapchat invented this thing called Snap Stories, Snapchat Stories, which is like this nice uh, modern dis disruption on social media. Uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg took note of it and started to copy it and like pretty much built the exact same thing. And this is where we end up today. Snap is seen as a dead stock walking. I think they had their quarterly earnings announcement, but a week ago, their share price is still absolutely the lowest it's ever been. Uh, they've gone through a bunch of layoffs and they've had a bunch of bad press as well. So it's a kind of pretty tough place to be in, but they were and still are a wonderfully innovative, creative company. This last example is probably the scariest one of all. Uh, presumably everybody here knows who Amazon is. Uh, does anybody know who Blue Apron is? Okay, oh, one or two people, cool. So Blue Apron is a m meal kit company. Blue Apron uh, sends you out recipes, you say you want the recipe, they will then send you all of the fresh goods and the recipe and help you, and you will then, you will then cook this lovely meal for your family. So uh, uh, Blue Apron were doing really, really, really well. So well that uh, Amazon registered a trademark. They didn't even announce they were going to go into the business. They simply just registered a trademark that let the market think that they might go into this market. And uh, Blue Apron, who had recently IPO'd, their uh, share price tanked. Amazon did go into the market and did start doing it. Uh, and they started to steal market share, do really, really well. And a couple of months after Blue Apron's IPO, they had uh, massive layoffs, 24% of their staff lost, lost their jobs. So this is like a pretty sobering thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, I kind of said to Patrick, so who's the crazy paranoid one now? Uh, am I paranoid or am I just paranoid enough? Uh, and Patrick was like, okay. And I said, look, the way I see it, time is short, opportunities are fleeting, money is cheap, basic execution is easy, talent is scarce, and the threat from one of the four is real. He's like, okay, you've got me. Uh, Patrick was like, Rich, okay, I, I'm now depressed. Uh, uh, how do we win? What's this talk about? How do, you, how do you fix it? What the hell has it got to do with uh, run less software? Hopefully this video will start. Okay, so in the movie, The Matrix, uh, Neo is able to beat a more powerful foe. And the way he does it is 
he's able to uh, somehow see the world more quickly, understand it, decide, and then act more quickly than his more powerful foe. And by doing so, he's able to beat a more powerful foe. So basically, he's able to, he's able to react and move a hell of a lot faster than the person in front of him and beat him. Now, uh, hopefully this isn't the Matrix. I'm definitely not Neo. Uh, but I think this kind of general idea of like moving super fast, uh, saving time, do it, doing everything you can to like understand the world, react more quickly is something that's pretty good. I think time can be saved and amazing fast execution is possible. And no matter, no matter what your competitors do, if you are always able to move faster than them, you will probably eventually be able to outsmart them and win. And for us as engineers, our time, uh, we think our time is best saved and spent when our engineers are highly productive, focused on only the most important things, only the things our customers really, really, really care about. And that's basically what Run Less Software is all about. Uh, it has three different pillars to it. We think we should be focused on saving time by choosing and using standard technologies. We should save time by outsourcing undifferentiated heavy lifting. Anything our customers don't care about, we should not be doing. And lastly then, with all of this time we've saved, we should spend that time creating enduring competitive advantage. Do the things your customers really care about that creates a moat around your business that makes people love your product. So let's talk about these ones in a little bit more depth, choosing standard technologies. Uh, I'm gonna use a little uh, war analogy, bear, bear with me, I apologize if it's overly masculine or whatever. Uh, but uh, back in the olden days, uh, you had loads of different swords you could choose with you to bring into battle. You would never bring all of them in and go, oh, this person coming towards me is tall, I'm gonna use a long sword, or this person coming towards me is short, I'm gonna use a saber. What you would actually do is you would pick one tool train with it, your whole army would train with it, and that is the one you would only use. And for me, choosing standard technologies is like really similar to this. Uh, we solve problems by constraining ourselves to using a small opinionated set of standard technologies within our company. And if we use these standard technologies over and over and over again, we become really good with them, and we're able to move really, really, really fast with them. I say not exclusively here, because you really can't be dogmatic about this stuff. You have to be industry aware. You have to know that the industry is changing around you. And so you always need to be looking out there going, what's the new cool thing? What's the new cool thing? But just because there is a, but just because there is a new cool thing doesn't mean you need to build your next mission critical production service on top of it. It means you should be experimenting with it in a, in a lab and de-risking it and figuring out what's the right time to bring it into your standard toolkit. If this sounds a lot like Etsy's Choose Boring Technologies, it is, it's really, really, really similar to it. Uh, who here has read this post by Dan McKinley on Choosing Boring Technology? Uh, few, few, a few very smart people have read that uh, post. I encourage everybody to go and find it. I think it should be part of the curriculum in colleges these, these days. In it, Dan has this wonderful uh, uh, set of mathematical equations. We're engineers, we love a decent maths equation. He says the total cost of ownership of any engineering decision is equal to the sum total of all of the operational costs which arise from, that, uh, from those decisions minus the velocity benefits you get from those decisions. And we think by constraining ourselves to using standard tech, we can have the lowest cost engineering engineering decisions, which are easy and cheap to maintain and fast and powerful to use and build. Uh, here, are, here, is like an, here is like an eye chart of our standard technologies at Intercom. And everything under that standard list, that is, like, uh, that is basically the refined list of every failed launch, every successful launch, every outage post-mortem, every security near miss, Every piece of lore and history we, we've gone through, uh, every piece of trial and tribulation has resulted in us having these set of standard tech technologies. On the non-standard side, there are some fantastic technologies there. It's like totally reasonable for some company to say, we're gonna use Go, Python, Google Cloud Engine, Spanner, Big Tail, 
Bigtable, Prometheus, and Kafka as our standard technologies. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what your technologies are, it just matters that you have an opinion and that, and that you have standards. The astute amongst you may have noticed that a bunch of our standard technologies are uh, AWS services. Which brings me to my next point. Outsourcing undifferentiated heavy lifting. This guy is Peter Drucker. I think he was born in like the 1906 or something like that. He said, there is surely nothing quite so useless as doing with great efficiency what should not be done at all. I think this is a piece of timeless advice. Uh, Jeff Bezos said many years later uh, that there is a lot of undifferentiated heavy lifting out there that stands between your idea and your success. He thought that about 70% of a company's time, money, and resources was spent doing stuff that was non-value add to customers. And only 30% of their time and money went towards building real customer value. And he launched AWS to try and invert that uh, paradigm. Uh, today, we, we kind of measure this stuff a lot. We think we're like pretty close to what Jeff was aiming for. We measured a lot, we optimized for it. We're trying to get to 80-20 uh, uh, in favor of creating things that our customers really care about. The last pillar is like creating enduring competitive advantage. Uh, who here's seen Fight Club? Hopefully this guy, Tyler Durgan, our, our CTO loves Tyler Durgan. He quotes this at me a bunch of times. He said, the things that you own end up owning you. So what are the things that we own and are we happy with them owning us? Well, the first one is Ruby and JavaScript. All of our front end is written in uh, JavaScript. Our customers interact with the front end. All of our back end is written in Ruby. This kind of knits all of our AWS services together. We're pretty happy running those things. Intercom Nexus and Intercom Messenger is like, we are a WhatsApp for business. So the fact that we write the software that uh, is the front end and back end of our messenger, we're fine with this. But this one, number seven here, bare metal elastic search. That one sticks in my craw every time I have to read it out loud. Uh, our customers do not care that we run bare metal elastic search. Uh, AWS's hosted elastic search is pretty terrible. A bunch of the other uh, hosted elastic searches mean that you have to put your data outside of your VPC for security and compliance reasons. We actually won't do that. So uh, if anybody here is looking for a good startup idea, if you want to go and build a great hosted elastic search, uh, service, come talk to me in about six months' time. I will definitely try it out. Uh, so, let's, so that's kind of all the theory. Let's talk about a few of the uh, example places and see if we have any lessons learned from it. First one's super easy. Uh, I joined Intercom four and a half years ago, and we had no, this was kind of before Run Less Software existed. We had no standards. Anybody, any developer could choose any relational database technology they wanted to use. We had a smattering of RDS Postgres, we had a smattering of RDS MySQL, uh, and we said, this is crazy, we're just gonna pick one. We picked RDS MySQL, standardized everything on it, and uh, this turned out to be a really good bet because probably about six months later, AWS launched Aurora. Has anybody used AWS Aurora? Yeah, it is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Uh, it is cloud native MySQL, it's like Spanner uh, on Google. Um, it, it, it was five times faster and 30% cheaper. So that, that this one standardizing on uh, a single technology worked out really, really well for us. The next uh, example was scaling our user storage system. So Intercom uh, tracks over one billion monthly end users. Uh, so one, one billion monthly end users updating a single database uh, is a lot of throughput. Uh, we used to build this thing, or we used to run it on MongoDB. It was falling over a lot of the time. We decided MongoDB was not going to be inside of our standard toolkit, and we wanted to rebuild it on standard technologies. And so our two main storage standard technologies are, are uh, RDS Aurora and AWS DynamoDB. And so we tried to build a thing on exclusively on Aurora. It didn't work. Aurora has like a single point of uh, uh, scaling. We tried to build a thing on uh, DynamoDB, and that worked awesome for scaling, but DynamoDB doesn't, doesn't support multi-part prim primary keys, and this thing had a multi-part primary key. So we're like, damn it. Uh, standard technologies, <laughs> is this gonna work? Is it gonna fit? And our CTO did this wonderful thing. He was like, well, we need a multi-part primary key, and we need 
infinitely scalable storage. So what if I put the multi-part primary key on Aurora, and then the then the like the rest of the data can simply just be a pointer to DynamoDB, and I can put all of the actual payload in DynamoDB. So we ended up replacing MongoDB with this hybrid Aurora plus DynamoDB system that was uh, uh, takes the best of both worlds, is beautifully scalable, and gave us a 90% cost reduction and uh, really, really stabilized our availability. Uh, and the lesson learned here for us is that um, choosing, choosing standard technologies is great, but, but you also have to be really good at breaking down these like bigger, bigger kind of hairy, scary looking problems into smaller constituent parts, which each, each of which are then small enough to be solved by your standard tools. The last example I'm gonna talk about is making our uh, inbox easier, cheaper, and faster. So a core piece of Intercom's application is our shared team inbox. And we build it three times. We have a version for uh, the web, and we have a version, a native version for iOS and a native version for an Android. So three copies of the same piece of software. It kind of sounds like run more software, right? Uh, and so we thought, hmm, I wonder if we could apply this run less software philosophy to this. And maybe, uh, maybe web technologies on mobile have advanced enough that we could just have a single uh, piece of technology and deploy it on three different uh, surfaces. And so we went to the mobile engineers on our team uh, who, who are all iOS and Android native specialists, by the way, and not, not so interested at the time in web. And we said, this is what we want to do. We want you all to go and try this. And not surprisingly, they didn't react so well. Um, we told them what to do. We didn't share it with them beforehand. We didn't share the motivations. We didn't share the problems we were trying to solve. We didn't share the love that, hey, you folks are awesome. We, we really appreciate everything that you do. Here's like something slightly new and different we, we, we would love to try. And uh, it turns out this, this project fell, fell flat in its face. We nev never made any progress with it. And we uh, lost a fair amount of trust for a while with our mobile engineers. And we had to work to kind of regain that trust. And this is kind of another lesson learned here for me is like technology strategy is great. You can sound like a battlefield commander, like command and control, and all, and all this type of stuff. But remember, all of us work in teams, and uh, it's people are the ones who actually do the work. And so you really need to uh, think about that first and foremost above any fancy technical strategy, which uh, looks good on some slides. And this kind of brings me to uh, somewhat of apology, I guess. Like, I, I realize in in these slides, I've used like a lot of like uh, war and masculine terminology, and I kind of did this because it just kind of came up at the time and it felt natural as I, as I was doing it. But really, uh, it's a reminder. What I want to do is remind us all that we are problem solvers. We're like a lot of us have done engineering or have some sort of a software engineering background, but really, we're here to add value to customers, deliver market impact, and we do that best when we operate as uh, when when we operate in diverse, inclusive teams and act as problem solvers rather than, rather than software developers. So I'm almost finished, uh, uh, near, nearly ready for lunch. Uh, so what's the, what's the prize? What do you get to do? Uh, like, what if you do this thing and you're able to move fast? What do you get? Uh, for me, it's like move fast and ship things. Uh, pretty proud that we have like continuous deployment, push on green, uh, CI, CD system, end-to-end -end deploy times of about six minutes or less. Uh, Brian at the back re-engineered this recently and is super proud of it. Uh, part of our run less software philosophy has just helped us de-risk de and solidify so many things that we can just keep moving at this relentless pace. And really, if you think about it, most things as it gets older, slow down. Like humans as they get older, slow down. Uh, but uh, we've actually been able to just move faster and faster as we've got older. Uh, shipping is so great. It gives like motivation to engineers. It's a morale boost. It creates product momentum, creates feedback and learning opportunities, and it also attracts engineers to come and work with you. Uh, if you do all this really well, you get to be like a cool business, grow fast, have loads of fun. And if you do this really well, hopefully you actually get to spend a lot of time with your family. Thanks.
do we have any time for questions? Yeah, we yeah. got uh, a couple minutes. Yeah, we got a minute or two. Cool. Any questions? Anybody? Questions? This is it pretty in depth? Here we are. Yeah. Sir? Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering about um, your, when you pick your technology, what, what drives it? How do, how do you. Um, uh, separate the, the, the evangelist for one particular technology as against, well, I'm not, that's not going to work in terms of what the business needs. Yeah. You know, sometimes you get told to use X when you know as a technologist it actually should be Y. Yeah. Uh, great, great question. Great question. Uh, in the early days, uh, our choices of technologies were driven by the skills our founders brought to the company. So. Our CTO was like a real Ruby on Rails guru, so Ruby on Rails was kind of our default technology. But then, uh, say over time, as we needed to get uh, really much, uh, much faster services, like the question is, do you use Go or do you use Java or whatever? And again, uh, we tried a little bit of both, but again, it was ultimately down to what was the, what was the weight of engineering expertise already in the company? Uh, I'd say now, how do we do it? Um, we have these things called wiggle weeks. So we, we kind of work to six weekly cycles and kind of every second six weekly cycle we have kind of a week uh, free and engineers kind of get to do pretty much whatever they want during that week, it's kind of like a hack week. And so anytime people are thinking about, oh, well, we know we have to do this thing in three months time, we have a wiggle week coming up. How about we try and experiment with a bunch of different technologies and almost kind of do like a bake off. We'll get like a couple of people, I'm gonna try and do it in X, you try and do it in Y, this'll be kind of like a learning cycle for us. That's, um, that's kind of definitely one of the ways. Uh, and I'd say one other thing is, we're very much about like solving problems. So we'll go, it's never you should do it in X. It's like, what's the, what's the problem we're actually, we're actually trying to solve? What's the real things we're trying to optimize for? What are the trade-offs we are willing to make? And um, just kind of think about it as a business level. Sorry, maybe this isn't a great answer. I might chat to you afterwards about it as well. Great, yeah. uh, we got one more back here. One more. Remember the burden of lunch is coming upon you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again for an excellent talk. Um, a lot of what you talk about seems of the culture in terms of even with standard technology and kind of just picking on one technology. And how do you shape the culture of the company so that people can actually align and say, okay, I actually prefer to try this new sexy technology, but actually I'm going to have to implement it in Ruby. And I guess really about hacking the culture of your company, how, how do you do it? Any insights? Um, yeah, I, th I think it's a great question and one of the things we, we try and do is be super kind of forthright with our technology. Like we are a very pragmatic company that's aimed at creating business value through technology. We're, like we are very heavy on user experience. We call ourselves product engineers rather than software engineers. We come out and give talks like this and explain kind of what our culture is. And so we try and be upfront about it and go, hey, if you want to be if you are a tech, like if you consider yourself a deep uh, technologist with like love experimenting with all of these different technologies and almost like technology for technology's sake, or always kind of want to be on the bleeding edge and trying the and trying the absolute new hotness, maybe this isn't the place for you. But if you are, if you love building things that people use, and if you love interacting with like designers and researchers and uh, product managers and if you love um, uh, if you love moving really, really, really fast and getting just so much stuff done, come work for us. But I think just kind of being upfront, writing it down, uh, talking about it publicly, and talking about it internally, and being and being being uh, proud of it, I guess as well is like uh, people people seem to pick it up. 